paradise found, the cradle of the human race at the North Pole, a study of the primitive world, by William Fairfield Warren, 1885. Houghton Mifflin, Boston. A book by William Fairfield, the first president of Boston University, placing Atlantis at the North Pole, as well as the Garden of Eden, Mount Maru, Avalon and Hyperborea. Warren believed all these mythical lands were folk memories of a former inhabited far northern seat where man was originally created. The Preface This book is not the work of a dreamer. Neither has it proceeded from a lover-learned paradox. Nor yet is it a cunningly devised fable aimed at particular tendencies in current science, philosophy, or religion. It is a thoroughly serious and sincere attempt to present what is to the author's mind the true and final solution of one of the greatest and most fascinating of all problems connected with the history of mankind. William Fairfield Warren, March 13, 1833, December 7, 1929, was the first president of Boston University. Born in Williamsburg, Massachusetts, he graduated from Wesleyan University, Middletown, Connecticut, 1853, and there became a member of the Mystical Seven. One, he later studied at Andover Theological Seminary and at Berlin and Hale. He entered the New England Conference in 1855 and was Professor of Systematic Theology in the Methodist Episcopal Missionary Institute at Bremen, Germany, 1862-1866. He was Acting President of the Boston University School of Theology, 1866-1873, President of Boston University, 1873-1903, and Dean of the Boston University School of Theology. 1903 to 1911. After 1873 he was also professor of comparative theology and philosophy of religion. He published The Truchy of Ancient Cosmology, 1882, Paradise Found, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole, 1885, The Quest of the Perfect Religion, 1886, In the Footsteps of Arminius, 1888, The Story of Gottlieb, 1890, Religions of the World and the World Religion, 1900, The Earliest Cosmologies, 1909, The Universe as Pictured in Milton's Paradise Lost, 1915. When Boston University was chartered in 1869, he helped make it the first university in the country fully open to women. He also helped create Wellesley College in 1870. He was the brother of Henry White Warren. In 1861, he married Harriet Merrick Warren, the first editor of The Heathen Woman's Friend. When he died at his home in Brookline, Massachusetts on December 7, 1929, at the age of 96. Warren wrote a book promoting his belief that the original center of mankind once sat at the North Pole entitled Paradise Found, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole, 1885. In this work Warren placed Atlantis at the North Pole, as well as the Garden of Eden, Mount Maru, Avalon and Hyperborea. 3. Warren believed all these mythical lands were folk memories of a former inhabited far northern seat where man was originally created. Warren's identification of Atlantis with the North Pole was maintained by positioning Atlas in the far north by mapping out ancient Greek cosmology. Warren equated the primordial titan Atlas of Greek mythology who supported the heavens on his shoulders, or supported the earth on a pillar, to the Atlas described in Plato's dialogue Crisias as the first ruler of Atlantis, Crisias, 114a. In Warren's view, all the Axis Mundi or Cosmic Axis of ancient legends, Yggdrasil, Eremensal and Atlas Pillar, had to be in the far north at the top of the world. To locate these in right mutual relations, one must begin by representing to himself the Earth as a sphere or spheroid, and as situated within, and concentric with, the starry sphere, each having its axis perpendicular, and its north pole at the top. 
The pole star is thus in the true zenith, and the heavenly heights centering about it are the abode of the supreme god or gods. Warren noted how Homer, Virgil and Hesiod all placed Atlas or his world pillar at the ends of the earth, meaning in his view the far northern Arctic regions, while Europides related Atlas to the pole star. Therefore, in Warren's view Atlantis sat in the far north, at the North Pole, since the Atlas in his ancient Greek cosmological mapping stood in the far northern zenith, under the pole star. Balgangadhar Tilak, an Indian nationalist and historian, quotes extensively from this book and presents his own studies of Vedas and Persian Avesta in his book The Arctic Home and the Vedas arguing for the presence of ancient humans in the Arctic. Abstract the suggestion that primitive Eden was at the Arctic Pole seems at first sight the most incredible of all wild and willful paradoxes. The author was the president of Boston University, and states in the preface that the book is not a work of a dreamer. It is a truly serious, sincere attempt to present what is to the author's mind, the true and final solution of one of the greatest and most fascinating of all problems connected to the history of mankind. In a word, Mr. Warren believes that the Garden of Eden was at the North Pole. Chapters on the results of explorers, such as Prince Eurek and David Livingstone, the results of theologians, such as Luther and Calvin, and non-theological scholars, Massey and the discovery of Atlantis, the author's hypothesis, tested and retested, astronomical geography, physiographical geology and prehistoric climatology. Atlantis, Ancient Greek T A T S Atlantis Nisos Island of Atlas is a fictional island mentioned in an allegory on the hubris of nations in Plato's works Timaeus and Critias, where it represents the antagonist naval power that besieges ancient Athens, the pseudo-historic embodiment of Plato's ideal state in the Republic. 1. In the story, Athens repels the Atlantean attack unlike any other nation of the known world. 2. Supposedly bearing witness to the superiority of Plato's concept of a state. The story concludes with Atlantis falling out of favor with the deities and submerging into the Atlantic Ocean. Despite its minor importance in Plato's work, the Atlantis story has had a considerable impact on literature. The allegorical aspect of Atlantis was taken up in utopian works of several Renaissance writers. To inspire contemporary fiction, from comic books to films, while present-day philologists and classicists agree on the story's fictional character, 9, 10, there is still debate on what served as its inspiration. Plato is known to have freely borrowed some of his allegories and metaphors from older traditions, as he did, for instance, with the story of Jage. 11. This led a number of scholars to investigate possible inspiration of Atlantis from Egyptian records of the fair eruption, 12, 13, the Sea People's Invasion, 14, or the Trojan War, 15. Others have rejected this chain of tradition as implausible and insist that Plato created an entirely fictional account, 16, 17, 18 drawing loose inspiration from contemporary events such as the failed Athenian invasion of Sicily in 415-413 BC or the destruction of Halak in 373 BC. The only primary sources for Atlantis are Plato's dialogues Timaeus and Critias. All other mentions of the island are based on them. The dialogues claim to quote Solon who visited Egypt between 590 and 580 BC. They state that he translated Egyptian records of Atlantis. 20. Written in 360 BC, Plato introduced Atlantis into Timaeus. For it is related in our records how once upon a time your state stayed the course of a mighty host, which, starting from a distant point in the Atlantic Ocean, was insolently advancing to attack the whole of Europe, and Asia to boot. For the ocean there was at the time navigable. 
for in front of the mouth which you Greeks call, as you say, the pillars of Heracles, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together. And it was possible for the travelers of that time to cross from it to the other islands, and from the islands to the whole of the continent over against them which encompasses that veritable ocean. For all that we have here, lying within the mouth of which we speak, is evidently a haven having a narrow entrance. But that yonder is a real ocean, and the land surrounding it may most rightly be called, in the fullest and truest sense, a continent. Now in this island of Atlantis there existed a confederation of kings, of great and marvelous power, which held sway over all the island, and over many other islands also in parts of the continent. The four people appearing in those two dialogues are the politicians Crisias and Hermocrates as well as the philosophers Socrates and Timaeus of Locri, although only Crisias speaks of Atlantis. In his works Plato makes the extensive use of the Socratic method in order to discuss contrary positions within the context of a supposition. The Dumais begins with an introduction, followed by an account of the creation and structure of the universe and ancient civilizations. In the introduction, Socrates muses about the perfect society, described in Plato's Republic, c. 380 BC, and wonders if he and his guests might recollect a story which exemplifies such a society. Crisias mentions a tale he considered to be historical, that would make the perfect example, and he then follows by describing Atlantis as is recorded in the Crisias. In his account, ancient Athens seems to represent the perfect society, and Atlantis its opponent. representing the very antithesis of the perfect traits described in the Republic. According to Krishas, the Hellenic deities of old divided the land so that each deity might have their own lot. Poseidon was appropriately, and to his liking, bequeathed the island of Atlantis. The island was larger than ancient Libya and Asia Minor combined. But it was later sunk by an earthquake and became an impassable mud shoal inhibiting travel to any part of the ocean. Plato asserted that the Egyptians described Atlantis as an island consisting mostly of mountains in the northern portions and along the shore and encompassing a great plain in an oblong shape in the south extending in one direction 3,000 stadia, about 555 kilometers, 345 miles, but across the center inland it was 2,000 stadia, about 370 kilometers. 230 miles, 50 stadia, 9 kilometers, 6 miles from the coast was a mountain that was low on all sides broke it off all round about. The central island itself was 5 states in diameter, about 0.92 kilometers, 0.57 miles. In Plato's metaphorical tale, Poseidon fell in love with Cleto the daughter of a vinner and Lucif, who bore him five pairs of male twins. The eldest of these, Atlas, was made rightful king of the entire island and the ocean, called the Atlantic Ocean in his honor, and was given the mountain of his birth and the surrounding area as his fiefdom. Atlas's twin Vidaris, or Eumelus in Greek, was given the extremity of the island toward the pillars of Hercules. The other four pairs of twins, Amphares and Evemon, Nicias and Atokthen, Elisippus and Nestor, and Isaias and Diapreves, were also given rule over many men, and a large territory. Poseidon carved the mountain where his love dwelt into a palace and enclosed it with three circular moats of increasing width, varying from one to three stadia and separated by rings of land proportional in size. The Atlanteans then built bridges northward from the mountain, making a route to the rest of the island. They dug a great canal to the sea, and alongside the bridges carved tunnels into the rings of rock so that ships could pass into the city around the mountain. They carved docks from the rock walls of the moats. Every passage to the city was guarded by gates and towers, and a wall surrounded each ring of the city. 
The walls were constructed of red, white, and black rock, quarried from the moats, and were covered with brass, tin, and the precious metal or calcum, respectively. According to Krishas, 9,000 years before his lifetime a war took place between those outside the pillars of Hercules at the Strait of Gibraltar and those who dwelt within them. The Atlanteans had conquered the parts of Libya within the pillars of Hercules, as far as Egypt, and the European continent as far as Tyrrhenia, and had subjected its people to slavery. The Athenians led an alliance of resistors against the Atlantean Empire, and as the alliance disintegrated, prevailed alone against the Empire, liberating the occupied lands. But afterwards there occurred violent earthquakes and floods. And in a single day and night of misfortune all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea. For which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way. And this was caused by the subsidence of the island. The logographer Hellanicus of Lesbos wrote an earlier work entitled Atlantis, of which only a few fragments survive. Hellanicus' work appears to have been a genealogical one concerning the daughters of Atlas. T. A. T in Greek means of Atlas, 12, but some authors have suggested a possible connection with Plato's island. John B. Luce notes that when Plato writes about the genealogy of Atlantis's kings, he writes in the same style as Hellanicus, suggesting a similarity between a fragment of Hellanicus's work and an account in the Critias. Rodney Castleton suggests that Plato may have borrowed his title from Hellanicus, who may have based his work on an earlier work about Atlantis. Castleton has pointed out that Plato wrote of Atlantis in 359 BC, when he returned to Athens from Sicily. He notes a number of parallels between the physical organization and fortifications of Syracuse and Plato's description of Atlantis. 27. Gunnar Rudberg was the first who elaborated upon the idea that Plato's attempt to realize his political ideas in the city of Syracuse could have heavily inspired the Atlantis account. Some ancient writers viewed Atlantis as fictional or metaphorical myth. Others believed it to be real. 29. Aristotle believed that Plato, his teacher, had invented the island to teach philosophy. 20. The philosopher Cranter, a student of Plato's student Xenocrates, is cited often as an example of a writer who thought the story to be historical fact. His work, a commentary on Demace, is lost, but Proclus, a Neoplatonist of the 5th century AD, reports on it. 30. The passage in question has been represented in the modern literature either as claiming that Cranter visited Egypt, had conversations with priests, and saw hieroglyphs confirming the story, or, as claiming that he learned about them from other visitors to Egypt. 31. Proclus wrote, As for the whole of this account of the Atlanteans, some say that it is unadorned history, such as Cranter, the first commentator on Plato. Cranter also says that Plato's contemporaries used to criticize him jokingly for not being the inventor of his republic but copying the institutions of the Egyptians. Plato took these critics seriously enough to assign to the Egyptians this story about the Athenians and Atlanteans. So as to make them say that the Athenians really once lived according to that system. The next sentence is often translated Cranter adds, that this is testified by the prophets of the Egyptians, who assert that these particulars, which are narrated by Plato are written on pillars which are still preserved. But in the original, the sentence starts not with the name Cranter but with the ambiguous he. Whether this referred to Cranter or to Plato is the subject of considerable debate. Proponents of both Atlantis as a metaphorical myth and Atlantis as history have argued that the pronoun refers to Cranter. 
Alan Cameron argues that the pronoun should be interpreted as referring to Plato, and that, when Proclus writes that we must bear in mind concerning this whole feat of the Athenians, that it is neither a mere myth nor unadorned history, although some take it as history and others as myth, he is treating Cranter's view as mere personal opinion, nothing more. In fact he first quotes and then dismisses it as representing one of the two unacceptable extremes. Cameron also points out that whether he refers to Plato or to Cranter, the statement does not support conclusions such as Automux Cranter came to Says and saw there in the temple of Neath the Column, completely covered with hieroglyphs, on which the history of Atlantis was recorded. Scholars translated it for him, and he testified that their account fully agreed with Plato's account of Atlantis, 34, or J.B. Luce's suggestion that Cranter sent a special inquiry to Egypt, and that he may simply be referring to Plato's own claims. Another passage from the commentary by Proclus on the Timaeus gives a description of the geography of Atlantis, that an island of such nature and size once existed is evident from what is said by certain authors who investigated the things around the outer sea. For according to them, there were seven islands in that sea in their time, sacred to Persephone, and also three others of enormous size, one of which was sacred to Hades, another to Ammon, and another one between them to Poseidon, the extent of which was a thousand stadia, two hundred kilometers, and the inhabitants of it they add. Preserve the remembrance from their ancestors of the immeasurably large island of Atlantis which had really existed there and which for many ages had reigned over all islands in the Atlantic Sea and which itself had likewise been sacred to Poseidon. Now these things Marcellus has written in his Aethiopical Marcellus remains unidentified. Other ancient historians and philosophers who believed in the existence of Atlantis were Strabo and Posidonius. Some have theorized that, before the 6th century BC, the pillars of Hercules may have applied to mountains on either side of the Gulf of Laconia, and also may have been part of the pillar cult of the Aegean. 37, 38, the mountains stood at either side of the southernmost gulf in Greece, the largest in the Peloponnese, and it opens onto the Mediterranean Sea. This would have placed Atlantis in the Mediterranean, lending credence to many details in Plato's discussion. The 4th century historian Aminus Marcellinus, relying on a lost work by Timogenes, a historian writing in the 1st century BC, writes that the Druids of Gaul said that part of the inhabitants of Gaul had migrated there from distant islands. Some have understood Amianus's testimony as a claim that at the time of Atlantis's sinking into the sea, its inhabitants fled to Western Europe. But Amianus, in fact, says that the Dresidae, Druids, recall that a part of the population is indigenous but others also migrated in from islands and lands beyond the Rhine, Rees just a 15.9. An indication that the immigrants came to Gulf from the North, Britain, the Netherlands, or Germany, not from a theorized location in the Atlantic Ocean to the Southwest. 39. Instead, the Celts who dwelled along the ocean were reported to venerate twin gods, Dioscori, who appeared to them coming from that ocean during the early first century. The Hellenistic Jewish philosopher Philo wrote about the destruction of Atlantis in his On the Eternity of the World. XXVI 141, in a longer passage allegedly citing Aristotle's successor Theophrastus. And the island of Atalans, translator's spelling. Original. T. A. T. Which was greater than Africa and Asia, as Plato says in the Timaeus in one day and night was overwhelmed beneath the sea in consequence of an extraordinary earthquake and inundation and suddenly disappeared, becoming sea, not indeed navigable, but full of gulfs and eddies. The theologian Joseph Barber Lightfoot, Apostolic Fathers, 1885, 2, pages 84, noted on this passage, Clement may possibly be referring to some known, but hardly accessible land, 
lying without the pillars of Hercules. But more probably he contemplated some unknown land in the far west beyond the ocean, like the fabled Atlantis of Plato. Forty-three other early Christian writers wrote about Atlantis, although they had mixed views on whether it once existed or was an untrustworthy myth of pagan origin. Forty-four, Tertullian believed Atlantis was once real and wrote that in the Atlantic Ocean once existed, the isle that was equal in size to Libya or Asia. Forty-five, referring to Plato's geographical description of Atlantis, the early Christian apologist writer Arnobius also believed Atlantis once existed, but blamed its destruction on pagans. 46 Cosmas Indica Pluston the 6th century wrote of Atlantis in his Christian topography in an attempt to prove his theory that the world was flat and surrounded by water. 47. In like manner the philosopher Timaeus also describes this earth as surrounded by the ocean, and the ocean as surrounded by the more remote earth. For he supposes that there is to westward an island, Atlantis, lying out in the ocean, in the direction of Kadera, Cadiz, of an enormous magnitude, And relates that the ten kings having procured mercenaries from the nations in this island came from the earth far away and conquered Europe and Asia but were afterwards conquered by the Athenians while that island itself was submerged by God under the sea both Plato and Aristotle praise this philosopher and Proclus has written a commentary on him he himself expresses views similar to our own with some modifications transferring the scene of the events from the east to the west Moreover, he mentions those ten generations as well as that earth which lies beyond the ocean. And in a word it is evident that all of them borrow from Moses, and publish his statements as their own aside from Plato's original account. Modern interpretations regarding Atlantis are an amalgamation of diverse, speculative movements that began in the 16th century. 50, when scholars began to identify Atlantis with the New World. Francisco Lopez de Gamara was the first to state that Plato was referring to America, as did Francis Bacon and Alexander von Humboldt. James Joannes Burkert said in 1663 or novo non novo, the New World is not new. Athanasius Herker accepted Plato's account as literally true, describing Atlantis as a small continent in the Atlantic Ocean. Twenty contemporary perceptions of Atlantis share roots with millionism, which can be traced to the beginning of the modern age, when European imaginations were fueled by their initial encounters with the indigenous peoples of the Americas. 51. From this era sprang apocalyptic and utopian visions that would inspire many subsequent generations of theorists. Most of these interpretations are considered pseudo-history, pseudo-science, or pseudo-ritiology, as they have presented their works as academic or scientific, but lack the standards or criteria. The Flemish cartographer and geographer Abraham Ortelius is believed to have been the first person to imagine that the continents were joined together before drifting to their present positions. In the 1596 edition of his Thesaurus Geographicus he wrote, Unless it be a fable, the island of Gadar or Gades, Cadiz will be the remaining part of the island of Atlantis or America, which was not sunk as Plato reports in the Timaeus, so much as torn away from Europe and Africa by earthquakes and flood. The traces of the ruptures are shown by the projections of Europe and Africa and the indentations of America in the parts of the coasts of these three said lands that face each other to anyone who, using a map of the world, carefully considered them. So that anyone may say with Strabo in Book 2, that what Plato says of the island of Atlantis on the authority of Solon is not a figment. The term utopia, from no place was coined by Sir Thomas More in his 16th century work of fiction Utopia. 53. Inspired by Plato's Atlantis and Traveler's accounts of the Americas, More described an imaginary land set in the New World. 54. 
His idealistic vision established a connection between the Americas and utopian societies, a theme that Bacon discussed in The New Atlantis, c. 1623. A character in the narrative gives a history of Atlantis that is similar to Plato's and places Atlantis in America. People had begun believing that the Mayan and Aztec ruins could possibly be the remnants of Atlantis. Much speculation began as to the origins of the Maya, which led to a variety of narratives and publications that tried to rationalize the discoveries within the context of the Bible and that had undertones of racism in their connections between the Old and New World. The Europeans believed the indigenous people to be inferior and incapable of building that which is now in ruins and by sharing a common history, they insinuate that another race must have been responsible. In the middle and late 19th century, several renowned Mesoamerican scholars, starting with Charles Etienne Brasser de Berberg, and including Edward Herbert Thompson and Augustus Laplongan, formally proposed that Atlantis was somehow related to Mayan and Aztec culture. The French scholar Brasser de Berberg traveled extensively through Mesoamerica in the mid-1800s, and was renowned for his translations of Mayan texts, most notably the sacred book Papalva, as well as a comprehensive history of the region. Soon after these publications, however, Inspired by Brasser de Berberg's diffusion theories, the pseudo-archaeologist Augustus Laplongan traveled to Mesoamerica and performed some of the first excavations of many famous Mayan ruins. Laplongan invented narratives, such as the Kingdom of Musaga, which romantically drew connections to him, his wife Alice, and Egyptian deities Osiris and Isis, as well as to Heinrich Schliemann who had just discovered the ancient city of Troy from Homer's epic poetry that had been described as merely mythical. 56. He also believed that he had found connections between the Greek and Mayan languages, which produced a narrative of the destruction of Atlantis. The 1882 publication of Atlantis the antediluvian world by Ignatius L. Donnelly stimulated much popular interest in Atlantis. He was greatly inspired by early works in Millianism, and like them, attempted to establish that all known ancient civilizations were descended from Atlantis, which he saw as a technologically sophisticated, more advanced culture. Donnelly drew parallels between creation stories in the Old and New Worlds, attributing the connections to Atlantis, where he believed the Biblical Garden of Eden existed. 58. As implied by the title of his book, he also believed that Atlantis was destroyed by the Great Flood mentioned in the Bible. Donnelly is credited as the father of the 19th century Atlantis revival and is the reason the myth endures today. 59. He unintentionally promoted an alternative method of inquiry to history and science and the idea that myths contain hidden information that opens them to ingenious interpretation by people who believe they have new or special insight. The Russian mystic Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and her partner Henry Steele Ocott founded their Theosophical Society in the 1870s with a philosophy that combined Western Romanticism and Eastern religious concepts. Blavatsky and her followers in this group are often cited as the founders of New Age and other spiritual movements. 53 Blavatsky took up Donnelly's interpretations when she wrote The Secret Doctrine, 1888, which she claimed was originally dictated in Atlantis. She maintained that the Atlanteans were cultural heroes, contrary to Plato, who described them mainly as a military threat. She believed in a form of racial evolution, as opposed to primate evolution. In her process of evolution the Atlanteans were the fourth root race, which were succeeded by the fifth. The Aryan race, which she identified with the modern human race. The Theosophists believed that the civilization of Atlantis reached its peak between 1 million and 900,000 years ago, but destroyed itself through internal warfare brought about by the dangerous use of psychic and supernatural powers of the inhabitants. Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Anthroposophy and Waldorf schools, along with other well-known Theosophists, 
such as Annie Besant, also wrote of cultural evolution in much the same vein. Some subsequent occultists have followed Blavatsky, at least to the point of tracing the lineage of occult practices back to Atlantis. Among the most famous is Dion Fortune in her esoteric orders and their work. 61 Drawing on the ideas of Rudolf Steiner and Hans Horbiger, Egan Friedel started his book Altergestic des Alterdens, Da, and thus his historical analysis of antiquity, with the ancient culture of Atlantis. The book was published in 1940. Blavatsky was also inspired by the work of the 18th century astronomer Jean Sylvain Bailey, who had orientalized the Atlantis myth in his mythical continent of Hyperborea, a reference to Greek myths featuring a northern European region of the same name, home to a giant, godlike race. 62, 63, Dan Edelstein claims that a reshaping of this theory in the secret doctrine provided the Nazis with a mythological precedent and the pretext for their ideological platform and their subsequent genocide. 62, however. Blavatsky's writings mention that the Atlantine were in fact olive-skinned peoples with Mongoloid traits who were the ancestors of modern Native Americans, Mongolians, and Malayans. The idea that the Atlantines were Hyperborean, Nordic supermen who originated in the northern Atlantic or even in the far north, was popular in the German Aerosophic movement around 1900, propagated by Guido von List and others. 67, it gave its name to the Thurlinga Welschacht, an anti-Semite Munich Lodge, which preceded the German Nazi party, see Thurlinga. The idea that the Atlanteans were Hyperborean, Nordic supermen who originated in the northern Atlantic or even in the far north, was popular in the German Aerosophic movement around 1900, propagated by Guido von List and others. 67, it gave its name to the Thulingesellschaft, an anti-Semite Munich Lodge, which preceded the German Nazi party, see Thule. The scholars Karl Georg Zschaetzsch, Duh, 1920, and Hermann Wirth, 1928, were the first to speak of a Nordic Atlantean, or Aryan Nordic master race that spread from Atlantis over the Northern Hemisphere and beyond. The clairvoyant Edgar Cayce spoke frequently of Atlantis. During his life readings, he claimed that many of his subjects were reincarnations of people who had lived there. By tapping into their collective consciousness, the Akashic records, a term borrowed from Theosophy, 70, Cayce declared that he was able to give detailed descriptions of the lost continent. 71, he also asserted that Atlantis would rise again in the 1960s, sparking much popularity of the myth in that decade, and that there is a hall of records beneath the Egyptian Sphinx which holds the historical texts of Atlantis. As continental drift became widely accepted during the 1960s, and the increased understanding of plate tectonics demonstrated the impossibility of a lost continent in the geologically recent past. 72, most lost continent theories of Atlantis began to wane in popularity. Plato's scholar Julia Annas, Regents Professor of Philosophy at the University of Arizona, had this to say on the matter. The continuing industry of discovering Atlantis illustrates the dangers of reading Plato. For he is clearly using what has become a standard device of fiction, stressing the historicity of an event, and the discovery of hitherto unknown authorities, as an indication that what follows is fiction. The idea is that we should use the story to examine our ideas of government and power. We have missed the point if instead of thinking about these issues we go off exploring the seabed. The continuing misunderstanding of Plato as a historian here enables us to see why his distrust of imaginative writing is sometimes justified. One of the proposed explanations for the historical context of the Atlantis story is a warning of Plato to his contemporary 4th century fellow citizens against their striving for naval power. 18 Kenneth Fetter points out that Krisha's story in the Teenage provides a major clue. In the dialogue, 
Krishna says, referring to Socrates hypothetical society, and when you were speaking yesterday about your city and citizens, the tale which I have just been repeating to you came into my mind, and I remarked with astonishment how, by some mysterious coincidence, you agreed in almost every particular with the narrative of Solon. 74 Fetter quotes A. E. Taylor, who wrote, We could not be told much more plainly that the whole narrative of Solon's conversation with the priests and his intention of writing the poem about Atlantis are an invention of Plato's fancy. Since Donnelly's day, there have been dozens of locations proposed for Atlantis, to the point where the name has become a generic concept, divorced from the specifics of Plato's account. This is reflected in the fact that many proposed sites are not within the Atlantic at all. Few today are scholarly or archaeological hypotheses, while others have been made by psychic, for example, Edgar Cayce, or other pseudoscientific means. The Atlantis researchers Jacques Colina Girard and Giorgios Diaz Montexano, for instance, each claim the other's hypothesis is pseudoscience. Many of the proposed sites share some of the characteristics of the Atlantis story, water, catastrophic and relevant time period, but none has been demonstrated to be a true historical Atlantis. Most of the historically proposed locations are in or near the Mediterranean Sea, islands such as Sardinia, Crete, Santorini, Thera, Sicily, Cyprus, and Malta. Land-based cities or states such as Troy, Aidy, Tartessus, and Tantalus, in the province of Monisa, Turkey. 81. Israel Sinai or Canaan. Citation needed and Northwestern Africa. The Thera eruption, dated to the 17th or 16th century BC, caused a large tsunami that some experts hypothesized devastated the Minoan civilization on the nearby island of Crete, further leading some to believe that this may have been the catastrophe that inspired the story. 83, 84, in the area of the Black Sea the following locations have been proposed, Bosporus and Ankhima, a legendary place near Trapton. Others have noted that, before the 6th century BC, the mountains on either side of the Gulf of Laconia were called the Pillars of Hercules, 37, 38, and they could be the geographical location being described in ancient reports upon which Plato was basing his story. The mountains stood at either side of the southernmost gulf in Greece, the largest in the Peloponnese, and that gulf opens onto the Mediterranean Sea. If from the beginning of discussions, misinterpretation of Gibraltar as the location rather than being at the Gulf of Laconia, would lend itself to many erroneous concepts regarding the location of Atlantis. Plato may have not been aware of the difference. The Laconian pillars open to the south toward Crete and beyond which is Egypt. The Thera eruption and the late Bronze Age collapse affected that area and might have been the devastation to which the sources used by Plato referred. Significant events such as these would have been likely material for tales passed from one generation to another for almost a thousand years. The location of Atlantis in the Atlantic Ocean has a certain appeal given the closely related names. Popular culture often places Atlantis there, perpetuating the original platonic setting as they understand it. The Canary Islands and Madeira Islands have been identified as a possible location, west of the Straits of Gibraltar, but in relative proximity to the Mediterranean Sea. Detailed studies of their geomorphology and geology have demonstrated, however, that they have been steadily uplifted, without any significant periods of subsidence. Over the last 4 million years, by geologic processes such as erosional unloading, gravitational unloading, lithospheric flexure induced by adjacent islands, and volcanic underplating various islands or island groups in the Atlantic were also identified as possible locations, notably the Azores. 87, 88, similarly, Cores of sediment covering the ocean bottom surrounding the Azores and other evidence demonstrate that it has been an undersea plateau for millions of years. The area is known for its volcanism however, which is associated with rifting along the Azores Triple Junction. 
This spread of the crust along the existing faults and fractures has produced many volcanic and seismic events. 93. The area is supported by buoyant upwelling in the deeper mantle, which some associate with an Azores hotspot. 94. Most of the volcanic activity has occurred primarily along the Tercera Rift. From the beginning of the island settlement, around the 15th century, there have been about 30 volcanic eruptions, terrestrial and submarine, as well as numerous, powerful earthquakes. 95. The submerged island of Spartal near the Strait of Gibraltar has also been suggested. In 2004, Swedish physiographer Stolf Erlingsson, 97, proposed that the legend of Atlantis was based on Stone Age Ireland. He later stated that he does not believe that Atlantis ever existed but maintained that his hypothesis that its description matches Ireland's geography has a 99.8% probability. The director of the National Museum of Ireland commented that there was no archaeology supporting this. In 2011, a team, working on a documentary for the National Geographic Channel, 100, led by Professor Richard Freund from the University of Hartford, claimed to have found possible evidence of Atlantis in southwestern Andalusia. 101, the team identified its possible location within the marshlands of the Donana National Park, in the area that once was the Lagos Ligustinus. 102, between the Huva, Cadiz, and Seville provinces, and they speculated that Atlantis had been destroyed by a tsunami, 103, extrapolating results from a previous study by Spanish researchers, published four years earlier. Spanish scientists have dismissed Freund's speculations, claiming that he sensationalized their work. The anthropologist Juan Villarias Robles, who works with the Spanish National Research Council, said, Richard Freund was a newcomer to a project and appeared to be involved in his own very controversial issue concerning King Solomon's search for ivory and gold in Tartessus, the well-documented settlement in the Donana area established in the first millennium BC, and described Freund's claims as fanciful. A similar theory had previously been put forward by a German researcher, Rainer W. Kuhn, that is based only on satellite imagery and places Atlantis in the Marismas de Inuyos, north of the city of Cadiz. 96. Before that, the historian Adolf Schalten had stated in the 1920s that Plato had used Tartessus as the basis for his Atlantis myth. Several writers have speculated that Antarctica is the site of Atlantis. 107, 108, a number of claims involve the Caribbean either as an hypothetical emergent island formed by a combination of the Venezuela Basin, the Greater Antilles, namely Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, and the ridges of Beata and Aves or specific locations such as an alleged underwater formation off the Guanacabamba Peninsula in Cuba. The adjacent Bahamas or the folkloric Bermuda Triangle have been proposed as well. Areas in the Pacific and Indian Oceans have also been proposed including Indonesia, that is some island. The stories of a lost continent off the coast of India, named Humari Kandam, have inspired some to draw parallels to Atlantis. In order to give his account of Atlantis verisimilitude, Plato mentions that the story was heard by Solon in Egypt, and transmitted orally over several generations through the family of Dropides, until it reached Crisias, a dialogue speaker in Timis and Crisias. 113. Solon had supposedly tried to adapt the Atlantis oral tradition into a poem, that it published, was to be greater than the works of Hesiod and Homer. While it was never completed, Solon passed on the story to Dropides. Modern classicists deny the existence of Solon's Atlantis poem and the story as an oral tradition. Instead, Plato is thought to be the sole inventor or fabricator. Hellenicus of Lesbos used the word Atlantis as the title for a poem published before Plato, 115, a fragment of which may be Oxyrhynchus Papyrus 11, 1359. 116. This work only describes the Atlantides, the daughters of Atlas, however, and has no relation to Plato's Atlantis account. In the new era, 
The 3rd century AD Neoplatonist Sodicus wrote an epic poem based on Plato's account of Atlantis. 117. Plato's work may already have inspired poetic imitation, however, Writing only a few decades after the Timaeus and Critias, the historian Theopompus of Chios wrote of a land beyond the ocean known as Meropis. This description was included in Book 8 of his Philippica, which contains a dialogue between Salinas and King Midas. Salinas describes the Meropids, a race of men who grow to twice normal size, and inhabit two cities on the island of Meropis, Isis, Sense, Ice Town and Nishimos. Micron? fighting town. He also reports that an army of 10 million soldiers crossed the ocean to conquer Hyperborea, but abandoned this proposal when they realized that the Hyperboreans were the luckiest people on earth. Heinz Gunther Nesselrath has argued that these and other details of Selena's story are meant as imitation and exaggeration of the Atlantis story, by parody, for the purpose of exposing Plato's ideas to ridicule. The creation of utopian and dystopian fictions was renewed after the Renaissance, most notably in Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, 1627, the description of an ideal society that he located off the western coast of America. Thomas Hayrick, 1649-1694, followed him with the New Atlantis, 1687, a satirical poem in three parts. His new continent of uncertain location, perhaps even a floating island either in the sea or the sky, serves as background for his exposure of what he described in a second edition as a true character of popery and Jesuitism. The title of the new Atlantis by De Manley, 1709, distinguished from the two others by the single letter, is an equally dystopian work but set this time on a fictional Mediterranean island. 120, in its sexual violence and exploitation is made a metaphor for the hypocritical behavior of politicians in their dealings with the general public. 121, in Manley's case, the target of satire was the Whig Party, while in David McLean Perry's The Scarlet Empire, 1906, it is socialism as practiced in foundered Atlantis. It was followed in Russia by Velimir Klebnikov's poem The Fall of Atlantis, Gibel Atlantidi, 1912, which is set in a future rationalist dystopia that has discovered the secret of immortality and is so dedicated to progress that it has lost touch with the past. When the high priest of this ideology is tempted by a slave girl into an act of irrationality, he murders her and precipitates a second flood, above which her severed head floats vengefully among the stars. A slightly later work, The Ancient of Atlantis, Boston, 1915, by Albert Armstrong Manship, expounds the Atlantean wisdom that is to redeem the Earth. Its three parts consist of a verse narrative of the life and training of an Atlantean wise one, followed by his utopian moral teachings and then a psychic drama set in modern times in which a reincarnated child embodying the lost wisdom is reborn on Earth. In Hispanic eyes, Atlantis had a more intimate interpretation. The land had been a colonial power which, although it had brought civilization to ancient Europe, had also enslaved its peoples. Its tyrannical fall from grace had contributed to the fate that had overtaken it, but now its disappearance had unbalanced the world. This was the point of view of Jacinth Verdaguer's vast mythological epic Latlantida, 1877. After the sinking of the former continent, Hercules travels east across the Atlantic to found the city of Barcelona and then departs westward again to the Hesperides. The story is told by a hermit to a shipwrecked mariner, who is inspired to follow in his tracks and so call the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old. This mariner, of course, was Christopher Columbus. 125 Verdaguer's poem was written in Catalan, but was widely translated in both Europe and Hispano-America. 126, one response was the similarly entitled Argentinian Atlantida of Olguerrier Victor Andrade, 1881, 
which sees in enchanted Atlantis that Plato foresaw a golden promise to the fruitful race of Latins. Of the colonizing world remains, however. Jose Juan Tablada characterizes its threat in his De Atlantida, 1894, through the beguiling picture of the lost world populated by the underwater creatures of classical myth, among whom is the siren of its final stanza with her eye on the keel of the wandering vessel that in passing deflowers the sea's smooth mirror, launching into the night her amorous warbling and the dulcet lullaby of her treacherous voice. There is a similar ambivalence in Janus Gerhus' sixth stanza Atlantis, 1917, where a celebration of the Faros linguistic revival grants it an ancient pedigree by linking Greek to Norse legend. In the poem a female figure rising from the sea against a background of classical palaces is recognized as a priestess of Atlantis. The poet recalls that the pharaohs lie there in the North Atlantic Ocean slash where before lay the poet dreamt lands but also that in Norse belief, such a figure only appears to those about to drown. <laughs>